Good evening, everyone. It's my true pleasure on the occasion of the school's fall open house to welcome you all to tonight's lecture by Left Architects, a partnership between Ziad Mohammed Jamal Adin, assistant professor at GSAP, and Makram Al Qadi, currently adjunct faculty at the American University of Beirut. Tonight's lecture represents one of the silver linings of this very difficult moment we are in, a new embrace of the remote event. Ziad will be presenting from New York. Makram is in Beirut and will join us for the discussion. And I know all of you are dispersed across the US and the world as well. I also want to note that it's been, it's been a very difficult time in Beirut and in Lebanon in particular, and my heart goes out to all of you as well. I still remember first seeing two of Left's earliest projects and recall being inspired by how the firm already dealt with many of the ideas that have continued to take form and evolve through their work, which invariably brings together cultural wit, narrative depth, formal elegance and irreverent, irreverent playfulness. The first is the 2001 Open Door House, a house with a single Duchampian-like revolving door in the center, architecturally embodying the Arabic saying, Man barra la barra, from outside to outside. Using this door, one would continuously connect outside to inside to outside again through the movement of one's own body. The second project entitled Disorientalism explores through the use of drawing the arbitrary ter territorialization drawn up by Western colonialism in the Arab region. Through critical representation and operations of deformation, which borrow from miniature paintings found in old cartographic manuscripts, this drawing undoes reductive representations of the Arab world, presenting it not as fragmented, frozen, or quote, backwards, but rather as a dynamic, continuous, and continuously evolving whole, which holds together at once vast diversities and utter cohesion. Since those very early projects, Left has developed an extensive practice at the intersection of design research and architecture as building, through which they have continued to probe the discipline, advancing novel positions against the reductive oppositions that architects still so often operates within, such as the relationship between tradition and modernity, the idea that there is such a thing as architectural language, or that so-called Islamic architecture sits outside of modernism. What left reminds us is that what is modern is to this day all too often still misunderstood as imposed through Western colonialism as opposed to an integral idea complete with its own local manifestations and advances. Their work also counters the oft repeated idea that the traditional Arab or Islamic city, in quotes, might be quote unquote irrational in its perceived informality. For left architects, Left, architects should, and I quote, strive to produce an architecture that addresses the social, economic, and environmental challenges of our time, that addresses questions of labor, material economies, and natural resources, and that participates in the construction of communities, encouraging a sense of stewardship to our environment and to each other. The sense of reconnecting past and present while also projecting a future in which conflicts and contradictions are beautifully resolved through architecture and the building of community resonates throughout the practice's work. From their Amir and Shakib Arslan Mosque to their Niha House of Many Vaults or the exhibition installation, The Right to Shade for the most recent Charja Triennale or their project entitled A Genealogy of a Tree, which was featured in Broken Nature, Design Takes on Human Survival at the Milan Triennial in 2019. The firm has been internationally recognized with numerous awards and presents a unique mo model of practice in which bridges between New York and Beirut, between research and practice, between East and West, between past and future, and between architecture and the world are drawn every day. Please join me in welcoming Ziad Jamaluddin and then Makram al -Kadi. Hello, everyone. Um, we would like first to thank uh, Dean Amal Andraos and the faculty at Columbia University for this opportunity to present our recent work at Left Architects. Uh, lectures and talks are always a good opportunity for architects really to reflect uh, on their position, kind of take a step back from the daily office work schedule and take a self-critical distance. Due to the easier logistics of recording the lecture from one continent or from one location, I will be 
personally presenting the recorded lecture, and then my partner, Makram, will be joining from Beirut at the end for the Q&A session. I would like to start the presentation uh, with a project uh, from our early days as an independent practice, a project that was titled Post Cards, which involved the production of a series of postcards uh, published at the time in the Canadian Parachute Magazine. And they were meant to be sent from New York, where both of us uh, resided, uh, to Beirut. There were 6,000 issues uh, printed, uh, which produced 72,000 uh, postcards. Uh, the postcard is detachable uh, from the magazine, and it's also mailable. And for us, the postcards addressed multiple urban and social issues, especially in the aftermath uh, of the Lebanese Civil War. Issues that we kind of aspired to address uh, in our practice uh, the years that followed and continue to do so, to do so. of course, uh, with many challenges. These postcards addressed questions of the housing, uh, the vacant housing and the housing bubbles kind of generated by high-end residential towers that were mushroomed across the city. Questions of pollution and environmental degradation, which is generated by uh, multiplying queries across the Lebanese landscape and dumping the trash and the trash waste into the Mediterranean Sea. But also a question of middle class uh, or upper middle class family, uh, family lifestyles. Uh, by simply looking at the key holder or the key chain of a Lebanese family, one can start to decipher how many cars they own, how many resort houses, uh, etc. And of course, kind of the continuous question of religious identity and religiosity, and the cultural wars that uh, were playing and that continue to play out in the public sphere uh, in Lebanon and perhaps also in the Middle East in general. But the early years of our practice, it was around 2010, uh, took place during perhaps what would have been considered to be a relatively op optimistic period in Lebanon. The civil war has just ended. Uh, downtown Beirut was under reconstruction with many projects being carried out by international architects. And it appeared that the Lebanese people are not anymore looking back at the past, at the war, although it was still sitting kind of uh, front and center as exemplified in this pictures. In the foreground here, you see Herzog de Meron building. Uh, sitting really in opposition and contrast to uh, the holiday A structure in the back with its horizontality, glass, uh, and openness. So by some metrics, Lebanon was doing okay. Uh, and it's during that period and around that time that we were hired to design our first building, uh, the Beirut Exhibition Center. Uh, the project was located in the landfill area of downtown Beirut, a landscape that really came uh, to reveal a much more contested and troubled states of affairs uh, than was immediately visible. Of course, the Lebanese Civil War took place between 1971 and uh, 76, excuse me, and 1990. The city was divided in two halves. To the east is uh, mostly a Christian uh, community, and to the west is mostly a Muslim community. And in between is a is a green line that gains gained uh, its name due to the wild vegetation that grew in this uh, deserted no man's uh, area. The fiercest, fiercest battle took place in the downtown uh, area. In yellow here, you see highlighted the buildings that were destroyed during the war, totally destroyed. And then in red are the buildings that were demolished actually uh, after the end of the war uh, by the real estate company that was responsible for the reconstruction process. The rubble of which uh, those buildings, the stocks were uh, dumped into the sea, uh, creating a kind of an instant landfill area of seven square kilometers of potential real estate. And the building really sat on that uh, contested land. Uh, the exhibition center was the first cultural program in downtown Beirut. And very quickly, we recognized that uh, we were sitting in a massive, potentially massive construction site and context, which is would be characterized by excavation and movement of uh, equipment and, and material. And so our response to the uh, warehouse structure that was handed to us and that we recycled was to basically skin it with uh, uh, this reflective uh, corrugated aluminum finish, which is really meant to reflect you know, the growth of the city that is yet to come uh, around it. 
So the building becomes almost a meter to the construction process in downtown Beirut. This facade, which refutes uh, shadow, uh, actually is also sitting on top of a reflective pool, underlying and emphasizing even further the placelessness of this kind of new tabella rasa. The interior is planned around a moving exhibition and storage walls that meant to adapt to the different curatorial needs. And during really the uh, lifetime uh, of the Beirut Exhibition Center, there were more than 50 exhibits that were uh, hosted, catering to local and regional uh, Arab artists. But with the decline of the reconstruction process and almost the complete halting of it due to economical uh, situation, uh, due to the kind of precarious geopolitical instability in the Middle East, and perhaps due to the uh, shortness of vision of the master plan itself, the, the landfill uh, area remains vacant until today with no building, with no construction. And the Beirut Exhibition Center ended up uh, really reflecting nothing but the sky uh, around it. Its delicate uh, aluminum facade, which meant to kind of be scored and scratched by the specks of dust and construction activities around it, was kept kind of continuously maintained and polished uh, almost by an army of uh, foreign labor. The landfill area became the depository of uh, unused material, archaeological findings that were kind of illegally uh, uprooted from their historical sites, and uh, building mock-ups. Finally, in 2016, the building uh, was finally dismantled and its facade now it's uh, stored uh, in a warehouse. So while downtown Beirut was undergoing a reconstruction, which is geared towards truly really a global uh, audience, the rest of the city, which was actually left underdeveloped, uh, was uh, absorbing instead the needs of the local uh, kind of Beiruti population. And this included uh, the prominent uh, Hamla Street, which is located west uh, of the downtown area. Hamla Street uh, is considered uh, one of the first uh, narrow modernist street uh, in, in Beirut. And in effect, it had uh, still actually demonstrated that an alternative and a more vital form of urbanity that is uh, truly serving the lower middle class and the middle class Beirutis. The street is pretty narrow, running east-west, and it's characterized by a series of you know, nondescript or generic uh, still unkept today, modernist structures. And like any good modernist building, uh, the, the buildings that are facing north are covered with one of the earliest curtain wall facades, and the buildings that are facing south are covered uh, with louvers and screens. <clears throat> but, but what really made uh, the street kind of a, more of a localized a modernist architecture is actually not the aesthetics of those buildings, but really uh, the density of them, the way that they are enmeshed within the existing fabric of the city and their urban characteristics. And as the building slightly lift up from the sidewalk, <clears throat> housing underneath many movie theaters uh, and cafes with steps up and down and through kind of bringing people in around to perpendicular street, a really robust uh, ground floor uh, articulation. And our design for Saleh Barakat Gallery, which is located just off Hamra Street, occupied, in fact, the basement of an old theater in one of those typical modernist uh, buildings in that district. And our proposal built on many of those urban characteristics of Hamra, namely by the introduction of a cascading active stair uh, through from the street, uh, through the lobby down to the gallery area, but at the same time allowing kind of a crane here uh, for the movement of the artwork down into the spit, uh, the pit uh, in the, to the main gallery floor. The main gallery is kind of uh, try to gain the maximum height by kind of leveling the existing uh, seats uh, of the theater uh, while using the pit underneath the theater uh, stage as the uh, storage area for the art. This model shows kind of the beam of light uh, that would penetrate deep in the gallery and the view back uh, into the lobby and the sidewalk from uh, the gallery below. So from the sidewalk, 
large doors open uh, to the main lobby where people and art would basically flow in and, and cascade down either the stair uh, uh, or uh, down. Uh, this is the track of the train that would pull the art down into uh, the basement level. As one comes uh, down, uh, landings start to give you kind of further glimpses uh, deep into the uh, gallery space. Uh, the, the, the stair kind of lands at the gallery level and it divides basically the projection room here uh, behind the stair from the main uh, gallery area, which is typically used for artist talks. In the gallery space uh, itself, we left the existing trapping of the old theater, including uh, the catwalks, uh, the light tracks, and we kind of stripped uh, uh, and, and exposed the deep beams that actually hold the building above. And here uh, we are led into the uh, back of house uh, of the gallery space where art could be slipped down into the basement storage area. We're actually uh, saddened uh, that uh, one of the people who we worked with closely uh, during the construction and afterward at uh, Beirut exhibition, uh, uh, sorry, at Salah Barakat Gallery was a victim of August uh, 4th uh, blast. And we would like to de dedicate this part of the lecture. Another kind of interesting distinctive characteristics of Hamra is its uh, really layered architectural history. Uh, as the main Hamra street was modernizing, as described earlier, the surrounding neighborhood remained somehow or somewhat in an intermediate state with a mix of building types uh, from different uh, periods. Here you see, for example, in the center, a smaller historical building with its large garden now entrapped by more recent buildings that followed modern uh, street alignment and obviously maximized the built up area. <clears throat> this is another condition where a large tree kind of lost its garden, kind of trimmed by the Lord, and it sits now wedged uh, between the sidewalk and the building next to it. In our project uh, room extension occupied actually one of those odd in between sites within with its own largely in, in Hamra neighborhood. This is a map that shows uh, the site here uh, in the middle with the, its own lonely uh, tree, uh, but also uh, the map uh, illustrate or kind of uh, shows the other lonely trees with similar uh, urban condition uh, that actually belong to the same generation of buildings from the early 20th century around the neighborhood. Those buildings used to have larger lots, but now they are subdivided and parcelized or turned into parking lot. So the project is sited right here. It's wedged between uh, two buildings and the room that we were commissioned to design uh, is an extension. It's a winter room extension of this highlighted apartment at the elevated uh, ground floor. <coughs> so the paradox of this project really that we faced was the desire for this winter room to be kind of open to the garden and to the sun but at the same time, the need uh, to be enclosed in this high density neighborhood for the sake of privacy. And our response was uh, kind of in two steps. One, to continue kind of this heavy green vegetation uh, and kind of to densify the street edge and to design a lattice uh, roof uh, structure that is made out of stacked uh, steel beams that are running in opposing direction. And that would act as a, on one hand as a shading device, but also would provide diagonal privacy from the neighboring tall buildings. The structure kind of peaks out uh, to capture here the sudden uh, light. And the sec sectionally, the, the structure you can see kind of slips into the balcony, which leads into the dining and the kitchen area but also has its own uh, access from the street. The other uh, cross section on the garden shows how uh, the new structure uh, embraces uh, the tree. It also uh, provides a, a doghouse for the domestic dog on one end and on the street sides it actually offers a small uh, little tower here that would house a bird feeder that would help basically feed the birds of those uh, inhabiting those kind of lonely trees network within uh, that were left over in the city. This is a street photo that we just took this weekend. The building is almost uh, done. 
This would be the tower where the bead feeder uh, will be hanging. Here to the back, you would see also uh, the doghouse and the way the structure kind of jets out and cantilevers to embrace uh, the tree. The tree canopy becoming almost a second roof uh, to the structure itself and the, the beams, the cross beams of the structure kind of bend themselves around it to adapt to the trunk. Here you see the, the tunnel that leads into the apartment with uh, what we're calling here kind of the entry shrine uh, that is meant basically to display multiple objects and icons uh, at the same time. The ceiling, uh, this is looking back to the garden and there is an extra uh, layer of shades with retractable shades uh, that tops basically the structure. And this is looking back uh, into the uh, street and from the street. So Hamra neighborhood we've just been discussing had, has many academic institutions that are built uh, within it. And it has long been uh, occupied or assumed to be occupied by a mix of population from diverse religious and non-religious uh, backgrounds. In contrast, the rest of the city contains a more fragmented or siloed form of neighborhood whose populations are more or less religiously based. The sociologist uh, Samir Khalaf had described this phenomena as the quote unquote, the ruralization of Beirut, where he states that basically the city's urbanity has failed to produce the imagined secular urban uh, citizen. Instead, the city is divided along rural territorial lines. So if you look more closely, you see kind of this area inhabited by people coming from South Lebanon, here from Mount Lebanon, Northeast, here from Mount Lebanon, Southeast, and these uh, territories uh, follows more or less a kind of a sectarian allegiances. So the city residents who work and live in those urban areas during the week actually frequently travel back to their rural towns over the weekend and over holidays. In a mirror effect, uh, Beirutis who actually are from Beirut have their own and spend their own summer, uh, summers in resort towns and in, in houses uh, in several kind of rural towns in the mountains of Lebanon. This, this phenomenon has been obviously supported by an extensive urban roadway system that was first conceived by modernist urbanists in the mid 20th century. Uh, a roadway network that perhaps started more uh, connecting regional cities, like in this case, uh, Damascus to Beirut, but that had continued to multiply in an ad hoc manner, making the small a mountainous kind of territory of, of Lebanon much more accessible via car. And it is this uh, fragmentation of urban rural living that produced and proliferated, uh, proliferated uh, the seasonal resort house type across the Lebanese la landscape. An out to out house, uh, the project that we worked on, is located in the ski resort town of Fakra, north of Beirut, and it really gave us. The, the chance to question and to kind of rethink uh, further this typology. Now in Lebanon, uh, there's an expression that goes uh, from the mountain to the sea. It's an urban myth and a slogan uh, that was actually promoted by the Lebanon's National Tourism Council in the 1960s and that really celebrated a climatic overlap in one moment during the year when one person can be skiing, but also uh, within an hour drive uh, down to the seashore and taking a swim into the sea. So the design that we proposed for that house located in the ski resort area was to collapse this geography and climate into the spaces of the house, producing a seasonal understanding of those spaces rather than a programmatic one. So, so here you see kind of a diagrammatic uh, plan of the house that show the different spaces that will be used, uh, outdoor spaces that will be used in different seasons. Further, when, when on one hand with uh, the warming weather, and on the other hand, when you kind of overlap the, this yearly calendar with religious holidays, and since we have 17 uh, different religious uh, sects, all having their holidays as national holidays, we quickly realized that the season occupancy extends even further. And so the house aimed to be used across all season, almost as a permanent home. Um, this drawing shows the location of the house uh, on this corner uh, with the possibility to kind of connect 
the upper road through the house uh, to the lower roads. Uh, this section uh, or along this path actually shows uh, the contrast between the hermetically sealed, let's say, villas and chalet kind of contained and siloed behind their own uh, fences in this part of uh, the resort in contrast to or comparing to, let's say, the diverse uh, outdoors and semi-outdoor spaces that the house uh, offers. The building kind of sits against, uh, hugs in, in a way the corner, it, it, uh, it bends uh, on itself in order to produce those multiple exterior spaces, such as uh, the piloty space, which you see here, uh, almost kind of uh, creating a hole throughout the mass of the building. The entry uh, kind of shallow step, steps leading to the entry uh, deck from the back, which leads to an exterior stair behind uh, these doors that takes you up to the roof garden and then back into this elevated uh, courtyard uh, space from which one can uh, basically go down into the quality space and then straight to the uh, lower street level. Um, one uh, taking this path would be able to travel up and around the external uh, spaces of the house without really ever entering it. And you see here, one of those conditions where the exterior stair comes in close contact with the interior glass of the house. A second of our uh, house projects is located in the Shuf Mountains and the town of Niha, two, two, almost two hours uh, away uh, from Beirut. And here we see a counter effect to this ruralization of Beirut uh, phenomena. One that perhaps could be best described as the, as the suburbanization, perhaps, of the rural area, which is especially manifested in these large family-owned states where uh, basically offsprings end up dividing what used to be an agricultural land into smaller lot, lots for uh, single-family seasonal houses and practically rendering the, uh, the, the landscape and the territory totally unproductive. The large site, kind of similarly large that we worked on, is just down the road here. It's also owned by one extended uh, uh, family. The, the title of the project is, half, is a house of many vaults, and it's really meant to house many families under one roof on a site that faced the same risk of this uh, kind of land uh, fragmentation. So the state, which is approximately 20 acres, uh, if you would follow the normal practice, would be separated and divided into five separate lots with five independent houses. The land will be kind of eaten out with a steep roadway that uh, kind of uh, trying to navigate the slope uh, terrain. Instead, our proposal introduces a large family house, almost located at the mid uh, plateau level of, of the sloping site. Uh, this house uh, would house all the collective uh, family uh, gathering functions, and underneath it, and the plinth that this house is built on it are where all the private wings would be uh, embedded. This way, most of uh, the agricultural land would be preserved. Uh, this diagram uh, basically shows uh, how this agricultural land is being irrigated. And this is done through, through basically two water reservoirs, one up the hill that is actually fed by a, a water pound further up the hill that is owned uh, by the family. And then another water reservoir is incorporated in the plinth of the building and collects rainwater from the roof of the building and uh, from the plinth itself to irrigate the lower part uh, of the landscape. Um, a further kind of massing criteria here worth mentioning is that uh, up the hill, there is uh, a religious sh shrine that is dedicated to the prophet Yo, and the house uh, in a way kind of bends back uh, and slopes towards uh, the shrines and uh, open, open the views uh, on the opposite side towards uh, the sea. This drawing uh, illustrates uh, basically uh, the cascading uh, kind of landscape from the main uh, building, which is composed of multiple rings, the first ring being uh, vegetation and then a flower garden which is then followed by a ring of pine and walnut groves uh, and oak, basically, that are usually planted in this area. 
this aerial view kind of illustrate the sighting, uh, the tucked private wing uh, uh, spaces uh, in the plinth, the water reservoir, which is absorbed in this uh, corner, and the beginning of the preparation of the terracing of the land for the agricultural uh, purposes. This is, shows how the building kind of rises up away from the shine, which is behind us here, with this faceted roof geometry that creates multiple ridges and gutter to collect and drive the rainwater into the reservoir. This roof is also clad with vertical fins of stone that meant to cast shadow on the roof itself and kind of reducing as such uh, the, the summer heat gains. Here you see a scene uh, where the gutter will be located. These kind of micro gutter will be uh, discharging the water in this lateral uh, gutter on either sides of the building as well. The, the kind of boxed pitch roof uh, is merged with an architectural, architectural of vaulted spaces below that acts as an organizing principle within the house. And here you see the interiors uh, kind of characterized by this lightness and fluidity of open the common spaces uh, of the house uh, uh, with this kind of geometry of vault and cross vaultings intersections. Um, so our, here our interest in religious architecture and more specifically in the architecture of the mosque started when we first saw this ad on the upper left corner here in Switzerland in 2011, which was posted in preparation uh, for a public referendum at the time, uh, calling for banning minarets from mosques in Switzerland, which uh, legislation that actually passed uh, and leaving uh, Switzerland a supposed Western democratic country uh, with, that, with only four already built minarets. And one, one can basically uh, extrapolate that this legislation say foretold perhaps the rising is the Islamophobia that came kind of uh, proliferated let's say in the west since uh, since then especially perhaps uh, today but for us this led us to raise um, many questions that are uh, obviously embedded in architecture here and that were uh, carried or addressed in our city of Islam's the project is a kind of a long ongoing critical research on the architecture of the mosque. This research has, was first kind of being proposed in academic uh, circle, first at Yale University by proposing a design a studio on the, on the mosques uh, and then of course since then at uh, the school at Columbia. Um, a building type that is really, uh, if looked at at all in historic, in, um, Western educational institution is looked at as a historical model with no contemporary relevance uh, to it. The uh, research was furthered in a kind of series of installations and, and exhibitions first here at pa Prague Quadrennial in 2011, uh, proposing almost a degree zero mosque in the form uh, of a carpet. This was followed by a mapping exercise on the architecture, on the plan, uh, of, of the mosques, uh, which basically evolved into a only like a map de depicting mosque nonlinear uh, transformation across 1,400 years. This study kind of foregrounded for us several characteristics of the, this building type. For one, it's extremely varied scales. Uh, it's uh, the hybridity of its program beyond the liturgical function the varied orientations of those buildings toward the sun and the varied quality of lights within those buildings, which is actually produced by its fixed uh, worldly orientation uh, towards Mecca and its relationship uh, to the city and the, the landscape, a relationship that started as of, of one of integration and merger. And uh, as we move into the 20th century, the mosque became obviously a much more isolated and detached object, object uh, from the community it's supposed to serve. The map was then exhibited in Oslo Architecture Triennale in 2016 in the, in the form of this low table. And then again in Studio X Istanbul in 2017 in the form of this uh, diorama. Uh, the interior of this diorama uh, plotted on, on the ground the mosque construction history while the outside mapped and plotted the history of mosque, mosque destruction uh, in the last hundred years. Through another piece uh, at the exhibit called A Prayer for One, the installation here questioned uh, 
the modernist universal secular human scale uh, of the model of, which is really based on the white western man and we, what we produce instead is the man and the woman kind of faithful uh, version of it uh, by tracing the metrics of evolution and the praying postures and kind of mapping them on the curtain uh, surface itself so the uh, the Middle East region uh, today is caught between two opposing uh, religious narratives. Uh, on one hand, there is kind of a mainstream sectarian narrative that declares that religious groups in fights and wars are all age old. They've been there forever and it's hopeless. And on the other hand, we see another kind of extreme counter narrative that pushes back and propagates its own kind of imaginary of a history of a so-called harmony among uh, diverse religious groups in the region. But of course, a close historical reading shows that sectarian wars and extremism, and in fact, a late uh, 20th century phenomena, it also shows that were, uh, for, that was a true that there were religious uh, infight and disputes historically, but this did not and does not eliminate the many successful attempts and the continuous desire to build forms of coexistence. And I would argue that there are plenty of evidence to this fact in the history of religious architecture in the region. And that's why you see ISIS here, kind of a religious Islamist extremist group from the 21st century, demolishing and erasing mosques that do not belong to their strict religious sects and, and, and their desire to construct a pure, uh, let's say, authentic uh, past. So, and it is within this context uh, that we were hired to design the Mukhtara Mosque in the rural area in Lebanon. And the question that first came to mind was, how do you design a religious space in a place that is characterized by multiple religious tradition with this complex history? The site that we were handed is this low uh, masonry cross vault construction, uh, sp more specifically these two units which was topped by a 1970s uh, concrete floor that's clad with stone. The stone construction itself is an extension of this 18th century palace up here, up the hill, and it sits uh, butted by this uh, parking uh, lot. And our first uh, uh, move was actually to erase, to demolish, uh, sorry, the uh, second floor, to remove and erase the parking, and instead kind of to create a civic plaza that sits at this uh, kind of critical rural roadway intersection and the uh, Shuf Mountains. Then an ex exterior structure kind of was added. Uh, it's shaped to correct really the orientation of the existing structure uh, below it towards Mecca, which is really all you need to be able to perform uh, a prayer. Uh, and the structures uh, that was exoskeleton structure, let's say, that's added, provided kind of a solid or a transparent reading of itself as one kind of moves around the, the structure uh, made out of this thin steel plate render itself almost transparent, kind of merging in this uh, thick green uh, backdrop. Uh, geometrically, uh, the added structure was uh, a critique uh, or, or an exploded version of the main, kind of mainly propagated uh, Ottoman cube and dome uh, mosque type, and turning it into concave and convex uh, structure. Uh, that would define multiple exterior spaces in and around uh, the existing uh, building. And that is basically open to anybody, not only the people who would use uh, the space of the mosque itself. So you see here how the plazas could kind of perform as uh, an extension of the interior space, but also you see how this uh, on Fridays, for instance, and you see here how the structure could start to act as a screen towards the interior of the mosque during the other part, uh, the other days uh, of the week. And here, the plaza that is created at the base is stepping up into the new public roof uh, uh, on the top, where one can sit underneath the canopy, kind of looking back at the valley next to a planter of uh, thyme uh, herbs. Two calligraphic words, uh, the word Allah or God on the minaret and the word Al-Insan or human being on the plaza wall are kind of pixelized uh, into this, and uh, in order to reinforce this thinly uh, formed uh, steel uh, structure with the intention of kind of confusing, confusing, excuse me, the ornament with the rational uh, structure. And the word 
human being itself recalls the uh, forgotten history of humanism uh, in the Islamic uh, tradition. A water canal that cascades uh, down from the palace uh, up the hill is also uh, kind of partially diverted to, the, to revive the 18th century pool uh, on the plaza level and then provide water to the ablution area and the sabil or the potable water fountain that also offers the travelers uh, water, fresh water, whether they are using the mosque or not. The interior of the mosque, which is you know, only 70 square meters, is marked by this punched uh, skylight that uh, in the existing crossbow that kind of accentuate the direction towards Mecca, you see here. And the mihrab, which is the apse, uh, usually a monodirectional object uh, uh, pointing towards Mecca, is here finished uh, with a polished stainless steel, making it uh, polydirectional and also recalling kind of the contested and the long history of uh, the mosque directionality to Mecca, which used to be to Jerusalem before that. And the, and the kind of the change in this uh, universal uh, criteria. The carpet that you see was designed in collaboration with the artist uh, Laurence uh, Abu Hamdan. It was envisioned almost as a, a graphical representation or an EKG graphical representation of the call to prayer, which is printed uh, on the carpet. We also worked with Laurence on composing a new call to prayer uh, that is spoken instead of uh, sang and, uh, uh, and only broadcasted on the inside. So as one looks through the skylight towards the minaret, which is the source of sound, is actually here is internalized within uh, the space of the mosque itself. To the back of uh, the mosque, there is uh, a, uh, the word ikra, uh, kind of inscribed in the wood uh, cladding. Uh, it's, the word Iqra is the first word of the Qur'an and uh, theologists have uh, long debated the meaning of the word because it could be translated as read or as recite uh, the Qur'an. Of course, a more progressive interpretation for Iqra is to read the Qur'an, which is uh, assuming uh, that the Qur'an is a post-structural text that could be interpreted and not memorize or recite the Qur'an almost as a meta-narrative. The project work was executed in collaboration and working with local uh, craftsmen uh, and, and local material and masons, but this was done also in combination uh, with high precision, let's say steel fabrication, which really accelerated the construction process and the installation. So while the existing uh, cross bolted space was being renovated, the steel structure was being fabricated and installed in a few days only. Um, our continuing research on the architecture of the mosque was taken in Sharjah Architecture Trinale uh, uh, last year, which was titled The Rights of Future Generation and created by Adrian Lahoud. And our entry uh, was titled uh, The Right to Shade. And the right to shade uh, for us was a critique of the hegemony of right to sunshine, which is a mode of operation that we understand it to be uh, uh, kind of promoting, pro that was promoted uh, during the 20th century modernism period, sh shaping the modern European city, especially after the end uh, of the Second War, kind of uh, promoting uh, street setbacks, standalone building, kind of sunny open plazas, all kind of becoming uh, identifying, let's say, elements of the new hygienic and rational city. Yet, when uh, this mode of operation was uncritically important, almost wholesale, in the modernizing Arab uh, cities, especially in Sharjah here. It meant doing away with the courtyard houses, with the historical dense fabric, with the shaded urban streets, but also doing away with the shaded uh, courtyard uh, of the mosque, which uh, in this case uh, stands literally as an isolated object in the middle of the roundabout. Our uh, kind of proposal, uh, after studying Sharjah mosques, uh, uh, proposed to introduce uh, basically the Sahan, which is the historically shaded uh, courtyard in order to provide kind of prolonged uh, shade condition across time of the day and throughout the seasonal and religious uh, cycles of the year. Here, uh, basically with the hope to provide shelter for a potentially a larger a new public that would not necessarily need to use the mosque. The installation itself was a one to 10 scale model 
of that canopy is kind of structure uh, lifted in the air and kind of beaming through it on the ground and animated scenarios showing how the movement of the sun throughout the day and the season would regulate and unlock the non-religious social activities that then will be interlaced with the religious uh, rituals. This is a, a really sped up uh, video that kind of uh, demonstrate uh, these uh, different scenarios. The sun first regulating the direction to Mecca as it shifts to the, for prayer purposes, as it shifts to the afternoon, there's a gardening activity that's happening within this uh, nursery, trees uh, nursery, uh, shifting to kind of uh, a feast in Ramadan, a soup kitchen, which follows by uh, religious activities, and then back to another season a few months later, where those trees uh, are more mature and they are moved uh, either to the central court, uh, almost as an emerging new rituals around the plants or distributed uh, to the neighborhood, kind of producing even more shades across the city. Tawaf was our entry for the design of the Lebanese uh, pavilion at Milan Architectural Trinale last year under the theme of Broken Nature, which we've done in collaboration with the Biosphere Shoof Reserve. And tawaf means the act of circumambulating or rotating around a sacred object. You can think here of, of course, of Kaaba and Mecca, but this is a practice that, shared, that is shared by many religious traditions, and the last of which is actually the Islamic uh, practice in Mecca. We were representing uh, the Lebanese uh, pavilion, and we took it on ourselves that the installation would challenge the idea of national uh, pavilion by taking on as a topic of investigation, the cedar tree, which sits as a two-dimensional emblem uh, on the Lebanese flag. Due to global warming, of course, the tree now, uh, uh, global warming is basically exposing uh, its uh, fragility. As the temperatures rise, the cedar uh, ecological comfort zone is moving up the mountain to higher altitude because the tree basically chases the cold winter uh, to reproduce. And here we have the trees at the highest point of the Lebanese mountains, so there is no more height to migrate to. Uh, the proposal for the installation was to uh, cut a cross section of uh, a cedar dead tree trunk uh, from the Shouf biosphere, from the Shouf uh, Cedar Reserve in, in Lebanon, spatializing it by superimposing the political and the industrial history uh, on its ring across its longer uh, geological history, which goes back 10,000 years to the end uh, of the Ice Age period. And then it's through this growth rings, the map becomes kind of interpretive, it unpacks and it unscribes the biblical, the literally and the political imaginaries that are constructed around the Lebanese cedar tree. And it superimposes it along the longer geological timeline of the tree itself, which goes back, as I mentioned earlier, to the ice age at the time when the cedar forest actually had died and never really uh, recovered uh, since then. The installation also uh, exhibit uh, uh, regional maps that try to subvert the myth of this territorial boundary of the cedar forest in Lebanon, which is very few of them. And here it illustrates basically the ecological extent of the cedar tree forest beyond those political boundaries, which uh, now we know the tree started, starts, uh, the forest starts in Turkey in the north and Lebanon is actually, is the utmost uh, southern tip. Uh, so visitors kind of are in, encouraged basically to circumambulate around the trunk mat as almost the new sacred, uh, kind of reading uh, the expansive history between the lines. And across the walls you see of the exhibit here, circling the floor map, you see photographs of the cedar forest uh, biodiversity and its seasonal cycles of rejuvenation. This is the plan of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, uh, which was built between 709 and 715. What is interesting uh, about the plan drawing itself is the fact that it reflects the history of the making of the building. Uh, so if you read at the bottom, the walls, Poche legend, they are basically assigned to different construction uh, periods. So what we learn is that the mosque in its final form, as it stands today, actually incorporates material from earlier a religious structure that had occupied the same site before it was turned into a mosque. This includes uh, a temple to the Roman god of Jupiter, which you actually see part of 
that perimeter wall of, of the temple here at the bottom end. It also incorporates material from the basilica that was dedicated to John the Baptist that also sat on top uh, of the uh, temple. And in the early years of the mosque, there are several historical accounts that tell us that the preserved terminus of the Roman temple was actually used by both Muslim, Muslims and Christians for uh, prayer uh, purposes, keeping in mind that uh, while Damascus was the capital of the early Islamic empire, it was still occupied by a Christian majority. But maybe more importantly for us here is that to this day, the Umayyad mosque houses multiple shrines within its walls, including the shrine to John the Baptist, which is nested within the colonnade of the main prayer hall here. And although the mosque serves the Sunni community more generally, it also houses uh, the shrine of uh, Hussein ibn Ali, who is the grandson of the Prophet, uh, which sits here in the perimeter of the wall, a frequently visited pilgrimage site for Shia Muslim uh, community in the Islamic world. So the Umayyad mosque becomes a syncretic space, which is not only shared by the different religious groups, but also allows the mixing of those groups within its courtyard. Our last uh, ongoing project here at Vassar College here in New York is titled The Office of Religious and Spiritual Life and Contemplative Practices. And the college asked us basically to convert this existing structure and its ground to house more than uh, 13 religious and non-religious uh, spiritual students. So of course the question we ask, how can we create those kind of syncretic spaces that on one hand uh, challenges the uh, challenge, excuse me, the secular religious divide uh, construct that is really a characteristic of uh, Western uh, understanding of religiosity but also that provides the specific needs of uh, each group to be able to perform their liturgical functions. And so the project started with a programming phase and a series of workshops, a total of four over five months, uh, with the aim of carefully documenting and mapping as much as possible the spatial uh, spiritual practices of the students, kind of moving away or looking away from the religious uh, authorities kind of prescription uh, of those uh, practices and instead <clears throat> trying to map the, the lived experiences of the student who would be using the house itself. It was an exercise that operated at multiple scales. We had a workshop on the house and then on the ground of the house and then on the campus scale and produced really unexpected findings which were then uh, consolidated in what we called uh, in the strong, the spiritual landscape of Vassar College campus and its environment, uh, which is a map that illustrates the unconventional interior and exterior spaces the students themselves appropriated or used across the campus to perform their rituals. Uh, in red here is uh, Pratt House within this uh, spiritual landscape. And the house was conceived to become part of this spiritual network and not to stand as an isolated object with its own duplicating, let's say, religious activities that are already happening uh, on campus. So this schematic design uh, proposes uh, uh, kind of a circular path that connects three other uh, campus pedestrian uh, pathways, uh, along which several uh, outdoor uh, pavilions were inscribed with the attempt, uh, with the exact attempt of producing uh, spaces that could be shared uh, by coupling and joining different religious group in one physical space, but also that encourages the mixing across those spaces uh, along the circular path. This is uh, a work in progress, a schematic plan that illustrates uh, the grouping of, of those different uh, religious uh, communities. For example, here we have uh, put together uh, in one architectural form, the, uh, the Muslim, uh, the Jewish uh, community, but also the Quaker uh, community. Uh, this space uh, nests uh, the, the Hindu and the Sikh community, and they are coupled with a water fountain and ablution on the other side that provides water for people walking along this path as well. Uh, the Buddhist kind of linear configuration is coupled with the labyrinth. And here at the entry uh, under the tree, there is a uh, Bible reading uh, circles uh, that put together the four different 
uh, Christian religious group uh, on campus. This is basically one example of this shrine pod, uh, so to speak, that is shared by the Vassar Muslim Student Association with their own direction towards Mecca. The Vassar Jewish Union following this line would be basically uh, the proper direction to Jerusalem and the Quaker circle of friends that would basically will be occupying the perimeter uh, uh, of, of the square uh, itself. And, um, you know, the architecture uh, of, of which, you know, is, is still very monolithic or is monolithic enough not to overly express the individual uh, group's identity, but with enough signifiers within the space, uh, like the multiple kind of apses here, the directionality of the tile or a seam in the floor, enough for the kind of the different groups to properly perform their religious functions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ziad, and, and thank you, Makram, for, for joining us. I know it's late, very, very late uh, in Lebanon. Um, this was a wonderful talk. And uh, um, I, I love, I mean, just to kind of start maybe a little bit with the end, you know, I love how uh, your practice that is um, so anchored in, in, in kind of Beirut and Lebanon is informing your practice in the US and this kind of feedback loop. Um, but first to, to just start more generally, uh, you know, if I think about how left appro approaches architecture and, you know, I, I, I see that uh, from the very first project, the exhibition center uh, and, you know, thinking about, you mentioned uh, Solidaire as the kind of downtown Beirut as conceived as the city yet to come. And I'm thinking about Heba Akar, another professor at GSAP who wrote um, for the war yet to come. So the city yet to come is what generates the war yet to come around it and it's in its periphery. And I think you sort of, even though uh, the building of the exhibition center sits sort of in the, in sort of the heart of Solidaire or on Solidaire is reflecting, you know, as, as the city yet to come is reflecting in a way the war yet to come. And I, I really, kind of look at your practice as uh, kind of bringing all these ideas and compressing them into the built the built form, but there are always these very, very larger um, ideas. Um, another sort of contradiction is in a city uh, where everybody wants to build new uh, and 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 sort of erase and you are intervening. Uh, you're kind of, the exhibition center is a, an act of preservation. The little outdoor room is an insertion. There's even mapping of, of trees. And, and the, so the, the question of context is, is really uh, quite important uh, for you, whether um, historical context, cultural context, or environmental context, uh, as in the, uh, the house of many vaults, right, where there's a kind of strategy that is uh, entirely almost dictate, well, that brings together um, cultural sort of um, resonance with a sort of strategy of the land and of kind of maximizing agriculture and, and, and water collection. Um, and it, you know, you've criticized the notion of architectural language and yet uh, I think kind of embrace typology and play with language. I want to kind of focus on that as well. Um, and, you know, I do also think about uh, your practice as um, very much anchored in this moment in the 21st century where uh, I, I, I would think that, um, let's say, Western architects or um, um, yes, Western architects, or you know, would would still claim that there is such a thing as the secular, uh, that, that you know that 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 somehow architecture uh, or or modernism or European modernism was, you know, or there's a kind of um, um, ambition to be secular. But your kind of uh, research on the relationship between religiosity and 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 um, and architecture and the contemporary uh, sort of undoes these notions over and over again. And here I uh, recall a talk um, um, a few years ago with Adam 
with Caruso St. John, where, you know, they sort of, um, I asked them about, you know, their fascination with churches, and it was taken almost as a, as a critique, but at a time when um, um, we are seeing um, how religion, how there is no such thing as the secular and religion is infiltrating, um, you know, everything again, I think your architecture is kind of revealing that, but also subverting that. And I want to hear about the subversion. And finally, um, architecture as of designing forms of coexistence. And certainly uh, we need those today. And, and so um, kind of very interested. So maybe, um, maybe we, we start with the question of um, the relationship for you uh, between, I mean, this is open house and, you know, you've shown really architecture as architecture, architecture as building, you're very much interested in building or exhibitions, installation. What is, how do you, how do you see this connection between your design research and your scholarly research and then, um, and then the, the practice itself and, you know, that feedback loop? Because clearly um, it's fascinating to see how much the research into the mosques, which I, you know, I know you started almost as a sort of a desire to, um, to sort of push or decenter or, you know, um, uh, architectural history or, or, or look at a, maybe an unstudied um, typology. And, and, and yet it's really informed the practice, um, you know, all the way to the, the Vassar uh, college uh, project. So maybe, starting with the, that relationship. Yeah, Makram, you're muted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for us, I mean, we're coming, both of us, I mean, from a more secular uh, background. Uh, so for us to be always identified uh, externally when we went out in the US or around the world, you're always thought of in terms of your religious identity, which is, which. We, we wanted to tackle to just really try to get out of it. So kind of to look at it from a, a, a non, uh, from an outside perspective in order to exactly, not necessarily subvert it as such, but reveal the lightness with which one can approach religion. And I can give you an example specifically in the Mukhtara uh, village, uh, the fact that uh, uh, it's a mosque uh, that in a village that does not contain any uh, practicing Muslims in a way, uh, reveals this understanding, this this potential understanding of religion, not something uh, that can be understood in oppositional oppositional terms, but something that can enrich uh, life of any community, even if it doesn't belong to the specific sect. Uh, the church down the road in Muhtara was built uh, as, for, as a Maronite church in a village also that doesn't ha house any Maronites, specifically because uh, the old princes of Lebanon had uh, Maronite friends coming from different religious uh, regions uh, and they always let they, they came Saturday and they left that night because they wanted to go pray in their churches so the, the Druze prince built a church for them so they can stay over the weekend so the, this idea of religious uh, uh, kind of uh, fluidity that uh, that is portrayed in the Umayyad mosque I think for us describes specifically the Lebanese uh, culture it's this mix uh, of uh, different uh, layers of religiosity that is a source of, I think, uh, uh, kind of benefit uh, to the to the population, and it should be seen as such. So we think architecture can can play a, kind of a role in in the war of ideas against uh, extremism. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is a great answer. Uh, totally agree. I mean, maybe one thing I would add is, in in fact, uh, sectarianism itself, as was uh, kind of imposed by the nation state, only aggravated. So secularism imposed by the nation they only aggravated sectarianism, so it's kind of works in, in reverse. Uh, and I think this idea of uh, religious uh, fluidity is what we are excited and interested about, kind of in representing and documenting. But also to go back to the relationship between design and practice, um, maybe the, present, the lecture presented somewhat a linear narrative, but in fact, we all know that uh, design thinking is not that linear. The mosque was actually really early on in our research the mosque was the, built early on in our research of history of the architecture of the mosque, so probably we would do something very different today. So it's never linear, it's actually, it actually goes back and forth. And I think this is where the practice is able to, the learning experience from the practice is able to feed into what to look for in research and, and vice versa. 
but we're also trying, I mean, even, even when we're looking specifically at uh, religious spaces like the mosque, for example, the Tawaf is understanding uh, ecology as this new uh, spiritual and religious, uh, I mean, imbuing it with a new uh, perspective uh, that is spiritual in nature. So kind of it flows even from one project to the other. I wanted to maybe uh, ask how you um, brought some of these concepts, which obviously enabled you to, um, you know, design this really fascinating kind of spiritual center at uh, Vassar College. How was that process of uh, insisting that religiosity is fluid? There are layers. It's not a kind of opposition. Right, and, and, and so you, you sort of, uh, I'm curious about that process of uh, engaging with different groups and, and how that um, conversation happened and how did it, um, um, how was it perceived that you were brought in as architects? I'm also curious about that. I, I mean, um, it's hard to say uh, we were basically shortlisted and we had to do an interview uh, where we presented uh, the Umayyad Mosque as a case study. And uh, the, the project really evolves with this dialogue with this multiple clients, thinking different groups, and with the director uh, of the center, who actually was the one who first asked us to question the, uh, the kind of the, sec the secular religious divide that usually happens within those uh, academic institutions here in the US. But what we find out by having these long conversations with the different groups uh, is that actually, uh, the relationship among them it much, is much more permissive and fluid than one would think. And it was more of a kind of a natural extension of that dynamic that already exists on campus among those different groups that led into the kind of the design thoughts that are embedded in the project and not vice versa. And I think it's this idea of uh, moving away from the religious authority and the way they understand and they prescribe uh, practices on their communities and looking at the lived experiences here as a uh, with the wealth of knowledge that it could, could produces not in term only in terms of the way they appropriate and they use the campus but also the level of permissiveness that they kind of bring into the conversation and uh, you ha you've wrote you've written quite a bit about this kind of understanding of the mosque as a typology of the everyday, right, as opposed to a kind of monument, uh, um, and, and certainly um, um, uh, um, when the destruction of downtown Beirut in the name of reconstruction was done, the idea of kind of excavating around the mosque to turn it into an icon that is not actually integrated in the, in the everyday is something that I, I know you've kind of reflected um, a lot about so this this fluidity is 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 really there, um, and so I wanted to to get back to this um, quote that I read of you know this 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 kind of concern with the notion of architectural language uh, and uh, and kind of your position vis-a-vis -vis meaning uh, in architecture because clearly you're you're really engaging uh, with typology with uh, um, and uh, not that typology necessarily signifies but but you are very much embedded with um sign signification or undoing signification so i wanted to uh ask about that Inclu inc including writing right and uh you know so uh, i mean we don't really approach the architectural uh, uh project from a standpoint of language but i th <clears throat> think we end up by producing a kind of a specific language to the project, just because we, we are more interested in the typology and re kind of configuring the understanding of the typology. When we did the mosque, obviously we are learning from the history of the language, so to speak, of the mosques. But for us to kind of subvert it and create something that is uh, uh, challenging or kind of questioning this language, we in the process create a new understanding of this language. Uh, so it's not something that is necessarily uh, as a starting point of the project, but it's kind of a subsequent consequence of that uh, research. Yeah, maybe I would add also that, uh, although we're not interested in this aesthetic uh, language agenda and the signifier, it does, uh, this does not necessarily mean that we're not interested in uh, architectural language. 
uh, as a form of experimentation and maybe more so in the mosque where really the question of ornamentation, which has a long kind of orientalist history uh, when uh, the mosque has been kind of continuously uh, documented uh, in the late uh, 19th century, ornament was always criticized as kind of confusing the aesthetics of the building. It's the building lacks rationality. So it's always been uh, degrading, let's say, the architectural uh, quality of the mosque by basically critiquing the ornament. And I think we were interested in kind of picking up on that uh, topic and reintroducing the ornament um, with the words and the meaning of the words within the yeah, mosque. In a way, creating, I mean, both in the carpet that we've done uh, as a collaboration with the artist and in the calligraphy that we've put on the outside, uh, Calligraphy becomes uh, structural in this case. I mean, uh, without it, uh, the, the, build, the mosque would fall in a way. Uh, and the third thing, I mean, th these are two places uh, where we've introduced this new understanding of what calligraphy could mean. Uh, for example, with the AK EKG of the carpet. Uh, even the word Allah on the top of the minaret <clears throat> was done with a bifolding of the uh, steel plates. So that from one side, <clears throat> you see God as a solid presence while from the other side, you see it as a void, kind of alluding to the idea of God rather than a presence. So even playing with these, I mean, uh, 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 kind of uh, generic understandings of uh, the trappings of the mosque, but in, and understanding them in new ways that could open up doors for uh, experimentation and the typology. So I wanted to ask, uh, to continue the kind of question of typology with your house of many vaults. Uh, which is quite incredible. It's more than a house. I mean, it's the scale is deceiving because on the one hand, it it's you know obviously it slopes down to the ground, but on the other hand, uh, it's it's uh, so you know how is it going to be inhabited? Uh, is it supposed to have multiple families, or I'm just uh, curious. Uh, it's a beautiful um, project. Uh, I mean, the idea again is to re-question uh, the, the Western notion of the exploded family. I mean, the, 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 the private house, the small scale house is something that we, we've been taught at schools kind of to uh, propagate and because it has a minimal uh, impact, uh, it's much more kind of condensed to the lifestyle of the family. Uh, we found out <clears throat> country, I mean, that, that was our initial kind of approach with the client. And then slowly we started to understand that the idea of the extended family in Lebanon is still something that is part uh, of the social uh, structure. And that's why it's something that we kind of embraced at the end with the house. And the idea is that the, the, the patriarch or the father and the mother uh, of the family will have their extended uh, kids family inhabit the house. That's why it has multiple uh, units within the house. And we've enlarged specifically the uh, living areas and and the dining areas to kind of accommodate this uh, a large amount of uh, people. Um, I was curious also, uh, you kind of really shared with us how your projects are built and who, who builds them and the sense of, uh, um, do, are you able across the projects to uh, uh, work with craftsmen or with, I mean, what is the relationship to construction uh, that you're engaging in, uh, in your project? If, 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 you know, something, you know, what you were able to do with the mosque, is that something that you're able to do in other projects or? Um... To a certain degree, yeah. I mean, we're always trying to find within the region that we're building a uh, craftsman from that area. So in Niha, for example, we've worked for, with stone masons from the area with uh, uh, millwork people from that area also. So within the trades, I mean, some, some aspects of the project, uh, it depends, I mean, we're, we're, we try usually, although it's more uh, a responsibility on us, but to, to avoid uh, the idea of a general contractor that will bring his own people regardless of the area that he's, that he's working in. Uh, when you go with uh, uh, kind of a main contractor with nominated subcontractors, you're able to uh, enforce your own uh, kind of uh, uh, network of people from that area onto the project. And this is something that we've tried to do locally. It also depends on the scale of the project. I think there are more resistance and larger scale project to kind of to open up the construction system as such uh, comparing to the smaller scale project. So there's also many challenges along the way. And it's really up to us to push that agenda. And it's not usually coming from the client side. 
So I want to make sure we have uh, enough time for for questions. Um, so um, one one question which I want to build on in terms of the practice uh, is uh, from an anom anonymous attendee. Hello, Ziad and Makram. I'm curious to hear about your practice as situated both in Beirut and in New York City or question mark in between. First, how does that operate practically? Second, what are the disadvantages and advantages of being at once inside and outside of the places where you work and build, especially since this is the position of many Lebanese in the diaspora or Lebanese in Lebanon with antennas outside of the country? Um, I mean, I think we had an advantage uh, before ending up in two places. Makram lived in New York for a long time and we worked together as well for uh, almost more than 10 years and we continue to work remotely today. So it doesn't come without challenges, but we've already built a dynamic, I guess, and a relationship that improves on that uh, far distance uh, collaboration. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's really depends on uh, kind of extensive talks. I mean, I talk to Ziad every day almost, and, and the relationship uh, on started before Zoom. I mean, this idea of uh, the long distance relationship uh, uh, got kind of uh, enforced uh, also uh, more, more recently with the pandemic. But the idea is a, kind of a continuous discussion that happens on a daily basis, and that's the gist of it. And I think there's a kind of a sometimes there's a, a disconnect that happens that that is beneficial to the project. I mean, specifically with this long distance. Thing. So, so we sometimes because it's more verbal, so we throw ideas, and somebody misinterprets the idea in a better way than what the uh, the person intended it to be. And I think uh, surprises. Uh, uh, good surprises come out of it in a way. Kind of Arabic telephone, isn't that? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, apologies for the long question. My question is about the Saleh Barakat Gallery. You preserved the form of the theater, but in a way let go of the old program. If it were up to you, how would you have instead preserved such a rich program like a cinema? After your experience with that project, how can adaptive reuse take on more than adapting the shell of a building into a gallery space? How can the adaptation take on more of a position to remember, revive signs of progress? Uh, I mean, it was interesting for us that we did not lose the cultural aspect uh, uh, of the space. I mean, it, it was a theater and it's still uh, within the cultural field. Uh, what you've try to do specifically is to kind of keep, uh, the, uh, as Ziad mentioned, the trappings of the old theater uh, and the specific uh, beams uh, and the catwalks. But more importantly, the de designing this uh, staircase that leads you down in a theatrical way, I think was an, kind of an ode to the, to the old program. Uh, and we've, we've had the, the opportunity, I mean, to work with, uh, with the Saleh Barakat, who's the preeminent kind of uh, a, a, a gallerist for local, Arab art and who knew Nidar this conversation with her prior to the uh, commissioning to us being commissioned for the project and she kind of gave his, uh, him the blessing and kind of uh, also was part of uh, the decision making process at the beginning of the project. Yeah so by the time we, we were hired to come into the project the space was not a theater anymore so it wasn't kind of a a choice for us to continue but I think it's a really good question but we were put in a position where the theater was not there and we tried to kind of excavate some of those historic layers of the theater and take advantage of them in the new design. Well I, I think it's also interesting what Makram you said at, at least it stayed a cultural uh, a cultural yeah. program and you know the kind of some of the um, experience of moving through the space or the beams or I mean there is a kind of register uh, of, of, of the cinema. Um, Had uh, it not been a basement I mean developers in Lebanon would have turned it into a residential uh, uh, apartment probably. Um, Thank you for this lecture coming from an Arab country. I know that designing a mosque comes with big constraints from working with imams, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs and the community. How hard was it to convince them with your design? And was it in at any stage, and was it in any stage more radical but had to be relatively tamed in order to be approved and built? I mean, uh, I wanna answer this because it's a very interesting question. Uh, we tend to think of 
uh, religious architecture as something that is dogmatic. And we've, we've tried to kind of uh, deal with this on conceptual level. But at the pragmatic, uh, pragmatic level, dealing with the religious authority that would give you the permitting for, for such a, an architecture, uh, they allow you, I mean, one would un, uh, kind of understand the monodirectionality to Mecca as something that is very sacred and dogmatic. But you can be off by 15 degrees. I mean, if you place the mahrab of 15 degrees from Mecca, it's within the range of what is acceptable. So there's this gray zone within the design of architecture that allows you to, to re recreate what, uh, what a mosque can be, specifically because we've always uh, kind of uh, uh, lectured about it. The, the idea of what a mosque is is neither dictated in, uh, by the Quran nor by the Hadith. So it's something that has historically been a construct and hence uh, apt for uh, a reinterpretation in a way. So another, so I'm gonna combine two, two, uh, two questions. For multi-faith religious projects, such as the project at Basar, to create non-denominational sanctuaries, how do you rely on architectural features rather than symbols? And the other, other question is, with the flexible boundaries of a mosque of the everyday, how do you extend the sense of spirituality from the interior to the exterior in cases of outdoor congr congregation and Friday prayers? Uh, maybe I'll answer the first one first. Uh... The design that we propose does not is, uh, lacks any of the signifiers or iconography of those different religious groups. Actually, there are no crosses or crescents or any form that would talk specifically about one religious group. Instead, it tries to reconfigure the spaces so they be able to perform the rituals that they need. So it's either the orientation or the, organ the organization, whether they're arranged in a circle or in a square or a linear. So uh, the, the project really doesn't embed any iconography and actually it leaves it up to the user if they want to, to kind of uh, populate maybe the walls with those uh, iconographies. And actually we had interesting conversation among the groups that we talked about what kind of iconography is accepted uh, in the space that you're performing. If you accept a cross, if you are a uh, Muslim praying towards Mecca and the answer was yes, as long as that the, the cross is behind me and I'm not praying towards it. So there's this really interesting uh, dynamic when it comes to the iconography and the, and the degree of acceptance of those objects uh, within, uh, within the religious space. So this also has a really interesting long history of, you know, with the spolia and the recycling of material in, in mosques, uh, some of them had crosses uh, kind of embedded in the capital and all they did is kind of turn the capital away from the visibility of the user and it was fine. So I think it's really interesting and a very gray zone. I think that like Makram had described it earlier. I don't actually remember the second question uh, as much. It, uh, how do you design for kind of outdoor congregation for the kind of everyday, everyday space of prayer is really your, the carpet, right? The... Yeah. Uh, Makram, Makram, I mean, I can say a little bit uh, something about it, which is this, the idea that the sacred is confined to the walls of the mosque is also a construct that we came to accept today and that and there's also more porosity let's say where the sacred spills into the say the profane and vice versa you know religious rituals usually take place in the streets of the city and not necessarily within a building so this is where kind of the religious spills out and the mosque uh, for instance uh, as one example is a place where people hang out socialize and maybe sleep take a nap so this idea that the the division between the sacred or profane is also something that was worth challenging, which kind of opens the design potential of outdoor plazas in front of mosque and what could be done with them, such as the Sharjah uh, entry that we presented. So we have time. I want to share two last comments from some of our faculty. Um, the first is from Christoph Kumpush, dear Ziad and Makra. Many thanks for sharing your incredibly inspiring and forward looking work, proving that it's possible to design across scales. Uh, from something as humble as a clothing hanger, thinking about the first project of yours uh, in New York um, to what you're doing today. Sorry, Christoph, I'm kind of editing a little bit. Uh, speaking of it, uh, it may be the most fluid, formally and programmatically smaller spiritual and one of the most Instagrammed, only surpassed by Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Dubai, fully functional mosque there is. Um, loving this power of smallness and your ground up approach. What would you say changes for you 
when you have opportunities to scale up projects of spiritual unity, which makes left so unique. So scaling up. Or not. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think it's a challenge that we're starting to face now, but uh, due to the economic uh, crisis in Lebanon, I think we're safe for a couple of more years <laughs> no with small projects. There's not scaling up, but there's the potential of multiplication of the same scale, right? If you aggregating. To, yes, aggregating. If you were able to work with a religious institution that owns many mosques, for example, there is this kind of multiplying effect uh, potential. It's like your your house of many vaults is a, a first a kind of starting answer, right? Yeah. To the problem of scale. Um, and from Ada, Tola, Ziad, and Makram, so great to have you here with us. Beautiful work, so smart and well-conceived. Obviously, you always look at things from the left side of the mind, which makes every project a critique and an invention. At once, the work on mosques starts as a right to religion. How do you see that moving to the civic realm? The idea of, quote, synthetic space is powerful and necessary at this point globally, given our very polarized politics. Can you foresee entering a similar research on a secular public typology? Uh, I think it's, it, I mean, for, for, uh, for me specifically, I mean, one of my interests has been uh, on the kind of the overlap of religiosity with the secular space. And I think Ziad shares the same concern. And this is something that we've tried, not necessarily with institutional, but even with the domestic space, how can we bring in this sort of spirituality, the idea of this revolving door and the room extension that we try to create. This is something that kind of already starts to allude to something that becomes an entry point, I mean, similar to the road shrines that one sees in Lebanon and kind of as you drive along the different landscapes. Uh, this is something that we've kind of learning in a way from the religious spaces and trying to apply in the different aspects of our work. Uh, so it's kind of this back and forth uh, two way street that we're trying to uh, navigate. Great. Well, I know it's very late in Beirut and getting late in New York and is early in Asia. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. It kind of opens up um, the mind in this time and also um, I think ends on a sort of optimistic note for how we can come together uh, and how architecture can uh, unable that really wonderful. Thank you both for joining Thanks us so tonight. Much. I'm Thank sure you much. inspired future architects. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.